Greetings. Good morning, good evening. I don't know, good evening in my time, but whenever you see this on YouTube, greetings. And this is the second part of our Lenten exploration through the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I promised chapter two in the, pre in the first video, previous video, but surprise, it's not quite all of chapter two. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 23, which is most of the chapter, but we're going to save the end to pair up with something to follow. So, stay tuned. Always stay tuned. There's always more to learn. The scriptures are vast. <laughs> anyway, let's begin with the reading. So, ch chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. But what can the man do who comes after the king? only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, if 
you're ready for something really profound, chapter two comes right after chapter one. Ooh, okay, yes, yeah, so I, I like to be silly sometimes, sorry. But this follows on what came in chapter one, and there we have the introduction exploring the basics of the problem of, of practical secularism, the focus on life in terms of work, focus on life in terms of earthly things, and the doings that we do in this world and in this life with no reference outside of temporality. We learned that this life is in vain or meaningless. Havel was the Hebrew word. The, the word in Hebrew, Havel, a breath, a vapor. It's there like a spray bottle and then gone. And as you can hear, that word and the phrase vanity and you know all that is under the sun repeats over and over again throughout this chapter. So here in this chapter now we are exploring three particular areas of life that are meaningless, that are in vain. So uh, just uh, in quick outline we have the failure of pleasure seeking to satisfy a secular life, we have the failure of wisdom and the failure of work or toil. All of these are vanity and a striving after wind. So the first section, exploring the failure of pleasure seeking. Some translations might have a subtitle that says uh, the vanity of self-indulgence, but that's not necessarily the best word for it, as we'll explain in a moment. So. Um, anyway, he's starting here. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So he's actually kind of testing himself a bit more than he's actually testing the concept of pleasure. Um, it's, it's about how he relates to enjoyment and pleasure and what he derives, what he gains from it. And the answer is not pretty. And he offers up his conclusion at the very beginning, sort of a thesis statement for a mini essay, very helpful for trying to understand what's going on in these paragraphs. He said, enjoy yourself, but this also is vanity. I said, of laughter it is mad, and of pleasure what use is it? So he's beginning with this realization, he's, he's sending it out for us right away, that all, all this searching after pleasure and uh, indulgence and enjoyment is in vain. And so he has the two terms here, laughter and pleasure. Laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? When you look at the particular Hebrew words behind laughter and pleasure and the way that they are used throughout the Old Testament, in general, you know, you don't want to be too hard fast with everything, but in general, the word for laughter is referring to having fun, a game, a party. And so he says, this is mad. This is a loss of judgment. It is escapism. You know, if you have to escape from reality, what good is this reality? Now, doesn't that resonate with much of modern life? Hmm, some things don't change. And then as for the second word, pleasure, this was generally more of a religious or a ceremonial appreciation. Uh, so the worship in the temple or the you know, procedure of law and government or the uh, exaltation of kings and the honoring of public servants. Uh, you know, so sort of a ceremonial, sort of formal type of pleasure and enjoyment. And he calls this useless. What use is it, he says, because it doesn't change anything. It doesn't improve anything. It maintains a status quo, it bolsters a religious or a political or other social entity and consciousness, but in the end, what has changed? What has improved? Well, nothing. And so the following section, or the, the, the rest of the section, the following verses 3 through 11, are just giving various examples of the types of ways that he could try to find pleasure and enjoy himself and appreciate life. There's a lot about wealth. I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards, made gardens, planted trees, uh, got lots of flocks and herds and slaves, concubines. And again, 
it's just meaningless. It's in vain. I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. And what was my reward for all this toil? I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. It's threefold denunciation at the end of this section, that this really is not worth it. Seeking a life of pleasure, enjoyment, be it a more hedonistic kind of pleasure, enjoying stuff uh, bodily and sensually, or a more you know intellectual or ceremonial or public kind of pleasure and um, you know appreciation for life. Um, all of these are in vain. So then he turns to wisdom, and this is perhaps the most um, overlap with chapter one which explored, rather alarmingly, the failure of wisdom. So here he is, introducing the question, the issue with a question in verse 12. I considered wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? He you know, is speaking as if he is the king. He's speaking on behalf of Solomon, or perhaps this is Solomon's ghost writer, whoever this Koheleth, this preacher, is. And so in the name of the king, he says, well, well what's going to happen with the next king? If I rule wisely, will that matter in 50 years? <laughs> what's going to happen? It doesn't matter. Uh, the wise person uh, has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. There's this recognition that... Um, whatever uh, wisdom people have is is a gift but you know what, what all is vanity and a striving after wind is what he finally concludes at the end of this section so wisdom he does kind of concede in here that wisdom does have its earthly uses but it does you know the, the whole like light from god sight for man sight for the wise but ultimately it has limitations this wisdom is good within this life, but what profit is there after your death? The same event happens to them all, he says in verse 14. The wise person's eyes in his head, the fool walks in darkness, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. The same event, the same fate befalls them. They come to the same end. The result is the same. Death. We all die. The wise, the fool, the rich, the poor, the king, the pauper, they all die. And so what do we gain from being rich? What do we gain from being a good ruler? What do we lose from being a bad ruler for that matter? Not that he uh, goes that far at this point, but wisdom, even that, not, um, it doesn't last. And so the third section, the final section of this passage that we're dealing with today is similar, and it's, and it's very closely related to it. It deals with work and labor or toil. And in some ways, he's kind of addressed this already earlier in the chapter. I mean, this is in some ways a, a stream of consciousness kind of book. Um, it doesn't divide very neatly into very organized sections. Um, and there are attempts to organize this book and understand some flow of logic, but the author just sort of sort of spirals, he rolls, he goes over and over similar material multiple times throughout this book. Uh, so you'll hear many phrases repeated and many subjects returned to over the course of his musings. So in verse 18, this last section today, today he says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. And this is right after saying in verse 17 that I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. So he, you know, his, his lack of faith and wisdom, his realization that wisdom is futile, is limited, leads him to a type of hatred of life. Not that he's suicidal or, you know, trying to, you know, become nihilistic and end it all or destroy everyone else, but just this 
lack of trust, lack of confidence in the purpose or meaning of life. And he does the same thing with work or toil. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. So, you know, just as he was concerned about the concept of royal succession, will the next king be any good? Will the next king wreck everything that I've done? <laughs> I mean, all, all, you know, all, this, this limitation and this dead end that comes with one's own death, you have no guarantee of what's going to happen after you and if your work will go on. So he observes that toil or work or labor is left to those who come after us or bequeathed to those who come after us. The work continues, the monuments are built, torn down, rebuilt, changed, everything is, you know, is here. And you don't know how your successor or the next generation or your child, children or the people who follow you in your job or, or whatever the situation may be, you don't know what they're going to do with what you've left behind. This is particularly poignant if you think uh, about King Solomon, who's being implied throughout this book, because his successor, his son Rehoboam, wrecks the kingdom of Israel. And very quickly, under his reign, the northern kingdom of Israel rebels from the southern kingdom of Judah, and Rehoboam is left with a remnant, you know, a very small portion of a you know, for 80 years, pretty neat kingdom, and he's left with a very small amount. So, uh, depending on whenever the author was writing, he could have been thinking about this very issue of, you know, hey, Solomon was a wise king, but his son was a fool. He listened to really, really bad advice and paid a horrible price for it. And all of Israel and Judah paid a horrible price for that as well. So, there is this concern as he wraps up. I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because, you know, sometimes you know, the next generation will do well and sometimes they will not. And what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils under the sun? Whatever the next generation does, it doesn't really change anything for you if you're dead it's all over this um, if you if you make your life about work make your life about earthly things in general whatever they might be it's havel it's a breath it's there and it's gone so the preacher Koheleth here laments this consideration of life as a whole he sees there's a sort of a emphasis in these final verses all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation so all his days life as a whole has this problem of meaning has this problem of vanity now perhaps this sets us up for a bit of a solution because if the problem is found in life as a whole in all the days then perhaps true satisfaction perhaps some happiness some joy can be found within the moment in the moment, as it were, living um, you know, without worrying about eternity, without worrying about the next generations, just focusing on your immediate situation. And we're going to hear bits of that in the texts to come. But I wanted to leave it there just so we could, just so we could really examine the problem that Kohelet is outlining here, the realization that it's vain if you do and vain if you don't, if you can yeah, rework a quote. <laughs> so our earthly lives are futile or pointless if you make it all about pleasure seeking or wisdom or work. Whatever you do will either be lost when you die or be subject to the next generation's whims for good or for ill. So this earthly heritage that we have is transient. No monument or legacy or memorial is going to be permanent. With this in mind, during this season of Lent, the Church reminds us to reinvest in spiritual disciplines, things that actually do bear fruit in eternity. Things like prayer, fasting, almsgiving. These are ways in which we lay up 
treasures in heaven where moth does not eat, where thieves do not destroy, where rust does not destroy, thieves do not steal, no, whatever. So there is this spiritual reminder in the midst of despair, in the midst of this almost nihilistic realization that life is a problem, life is futile on its own terms, there is going to be a spiritual hope beyond that. So stay tuned for next time as we continue and start getting into some of those pieces of hope. But in the meantime, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.